Welcome back to the Win With Dice podcast, a podcast featuring members of the Win With Dice team, and this week, a special guest. Uh, joining me is Ramon. Hey, guys. And joining us this week is Tom. Hey. Um, so I'm sure many of you, because we talk about Lancer a whole lot of here, I'm sure many of you recognize Tom already as the lead rule designer on Lancer and a co-founder of Massive Press. Uh, we're going to get into talking about some Lancer stuff this week. Hell yeah. If this is your first time listening to the Woman With Dice podcast, this is a podcast all about tabletop RPGs. Calvin and I like to get a casual approach to the hobby, so we like to talk about the games that we play and the games that we run and the cool, wonderful people we get to experience the hobby with. If this is your first time, you know, hearing about tabletop RPGs, uh, what are you doing? Go find yourself a table and go have some fun. If you are a player at someone's table, maybe it's your turn to become the GM for your group. Indeed. So, uh, as I said, we're going to be talking a whole lot about uh, Lancer, uh, as we have been doing for the past few weeks. Um, this is basically our third Lancer month, I guess, where we have a bunch of uh, Lancer-related uh, conversations in a row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we call it, I think someone uh, called it Lancer Fest. Lancer Fest is back. We usually do this <laughs> at the beginning of the year because we always make these like grand sweeping statements of like New Year's resolutions, do more Lancer stuff. And then, you know, our audience hold us accountable. Uh, and uh, Trey usually just bullies us to do it anyway. So we're here <laughs> and we got Tom. <laughs> but before we get into all of that fun and cool stuff, we have to get to the most important part of the show. The Win With Dice Weekly GM Tip of the Week. Yes, the Win With Dice Weekly GM Tip of the Week. Uh, brought to you by Tom. Thanks, Tom. Hey, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> What's my weekly GM Tip of the Week? Um, I, I would say, uh, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm a forever GM. I don't know about you guys, but like, I, I'm rarely a player, unfortunately, which sucks. But uh, it is what it is. Um, I, I think uh, something I've learned recently is to not be afraid to like pull back the game to discuss stuff out of character and with the people at the table when like you want to move a narrative forward sometimes people get stuck like talking in character about what they want their characters to do or where they want to go or things like that don't be afraid of like pulling it back and saying hey guys out of character what do we want to do right now take like yeah. three minutes to do that and then pull it back in because it'll save you a lot of time <laughs> and it'll save yeah, you a lot of yeah. energy yeah, it's For really sure. it's ex like I've started I've been running Pathfinder 2 recently, which has been a pretty good experience, I will say. And I've actually started doing something where at the start of every session, I've been like, "Guys, what's our goal with the session today? What are we doing as a group?" And it has been great because it means there's no longer any weird waffling about trying to figure out what the group wants to do, trying to feel things out in character, which might be kind of awkward. Uh, everyone knows today we're going to try and do this. So everyone's on the same page from the get-go and it, it like speeds the game up immensely. <laughs> it's really good. Also helps if there's any like interpersonal conflict, people are feeling uncomfortable with the situation or you want to adjudicate the situation that's going on. Don't do it in character, pull it out of the game and like take care of it for like five minutes. For sure. Like I think that's, uh, I, I often, uh, I mean, everybody loves this, like the, the you know the song and the dance of all the voices and being in character mm. and that's like you know their idea of like what role playing is but i think that like the the idea of just like just taking it back for a second remembering that like you know we can just uh abstract those conversations that the characters would have in yeah. person right but like just like get to the point find the, the actual meat and potatoes of what the objective is and get everybody on track and then you could do the funny voices for like the quick yeah. clips and, and shit like that right yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, yeah. Just take your time to like to like uh, unpack stuff where you need to. Don't, don't you don't have to be Im immersed all the time to do stuff, man. Just make sure things are gonna go smoothly, right? That's that's my piece of advice for you. Yeah, and I think yeah. players can you know they can hop in and do that as well if they feel like mm. things are going like being very circular and just not going in any particular direction. Mm. Yeah, totally, totally. Because people get people get caught in that a lot. I I, I think there's actually a style. People like to, one of the big ways people consume RPGs nowadays is through streaming shows, right? Like uh, Critical Role or Dimension 20 or whatever. And mm. uh, they don't really think about the fact that those shows are, they are, you know, authentic experiences of like people playing the game, but they are putting it on for for a show, right? They, yeah. are, they are trying to be immersive and contiguous and not really most people's experience at the table. When I, when I play D&D 3rd Edition, Back in the day when I started playing it, like it was much yeah. more common to just not be in character most of the time, right? And just be like, 
ah, my guy does this, you know, <laughs> you know, like exactly. Um, I, I, yeah. I was also like that person. I mean, I started right. with three point five, and uh, right. you know, our we were a bunch of teenage goobers, right? Right, <laughs> so it's like, right, right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The the typical table does not look like like uh, you know Bre- Brendan's table or Matt Morris's table or whatever for sure. So. Yeah, I, it's like it's like theater with extra steps. Pretty much what they're doing. Uh, totally, totally. Yeah, not everyone is comfortable with improv either. You know, like and and don't feel like you have to do it. Just 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 like make the game move, right? <laughs> That's what everyone likes. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've had really good moments where I've started doing it more recently. I've been like, you know, pe- people are having trouble with some something in the game, and I, I have to go. Okay, let's pull it back. Like, let me ask you, what does your character think about this? Like, I, I had a situation where like. Um, the players are about to like execute a prisoner, right? This is a common thing if you play D&D. For some reason, players love to execute prisoners in that game. I don't know why. And I had to pull it back and be like, hey guys, let's take a moment. Um, you know, are we comfortable like executing a defenseless person? Are your characters comfortable executing a defenseless person? Is that something that your characters would do in, in their characters? Do they believe in that? Like it's massively taboo in, in all the lands of this world we're in. To, to, to kill a, a prisoner like it's considered a very evil act like is that something you're okay with and it totally pulled it back and it made people actually consider the actions of their characters and the comfort of people at the table and stuff and it was like a really good move to do that rather than just letting things play out and not intervening and not like trying to to work it out because people didn't have the time to process it so interesting uh, yeah try it try it in your yeah. own game give it a shot yeah i i think the i like I like that because it's like a consensus kind of thing because mm-hmm. usually I would let it play out and let the players always get like the player who wants to object the opportunity to object and you know try to move the situation to a where place where like they're comfortable right because like I want that kind of inter party like discourse to happen but I guess that's all happening in character that could actually just happen out of character and it could, probably yeah, yeah. way faster right yeah yeah, exactly. Uh, for sure. For sure. And, like, I also think that sometimes, like, uh, even if you do end up, like, capturing somebody, it's usually after a fight. Maybe somebody got hurt really bad and, you know, emotions are high or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes it's, like, you got to take a beat to be like, hey, guys, I know these guys just tried to kill you. But, like, you know, let's just talk about this for a second. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It can, be, it can be, like, when you have clashing character motivations, too, right? Like, which, which often happens sometimes people feel uncomfortable playing those out in character right but they feel more comfortable pulling it back and thinking about like how would my character react and knowing also how another person's character would react out of character can make it more comfortable for people when they're playing out those like inter inter, inter party conflicts for sure yeah, so for sure. Uh, yeah highly recommend it give it a shot i mean i've been working more of it into my gming style and i've, I've loved doing it so yeah, I was gonna say, are you playing with people that you've played with like lots in the past, like a, like an ongoing yeah. group of friends? Okay, yeah, so you yeah, kind of know yeah. these people a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I, I do, but it's it's also um, it's also something I do with every group, and uh, and and it's it's a big variance in play style between like some people really like the narrative style stuff. I have a couple people who are very like I have one guy who's basically like I will play every game as rules as written as possible, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it's really helpful having that kind of like tool when you have such a variance of players and, and I've, I've, i run for pretty large groups a lot of the time even though it is some of the same people like uh you do have a lot of different needs um in that group and uh and so it's been very helpful to kind of develop that that tool as i've gone i've become more comfortable with it because i think as a gm you feel like you have to perform all the time but it's actually helpful sometimes to remember your other role is also as an adjudicator and a um a uh I'm trying to think of the word my, I'm, I'm perpetually dad brained by the way so if i ever pause on something it's because i'm uh i'm, I'm 34 and i have a two-year-old um a facilitator and, and an adjudicator right so between the group right that's the other role you have other than just being a performer so uh that that's important to remember that thing in fact some people get by uh just kind of being a facilitator and not necessarily a performer and i think that's a legit way to dm right you don't have to do any yeah. like, funny character voices or whatever. You just have to do your job, <laughs> right? And make the game flow yeah. smoothly. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, yeah. I, I'll, I mean, Calvin, you got anything to add to, add to that? Oh, I was, I was just going to comment that, you know, it is sometimes easy. Um, again, from a player perspective, it can be easy to get pretty lost in the sauce when you're in the middle of a character thing that you don't really pull back and think, oh, you know, you're actually at a table with real people. You want to yeah. make sure everybody's still comfortable. Yeah, totally, totally. So uh, there you go, folks. There's your tip of the week. Just uh, pull things back uh, for the table and just, you know, have like a, a I guess, um, 
how should I summarize all of Tom's words? <laughs> a, a, a high level conversation about what is playing out. You don't need to do the voices. You don't need to be in character. Just, you know, focus on the story, focus on the objective and, uh, you know, get a little bit oriented before you dive back into that, you know, that, that character voice or, or whatever you're trying to do. All right, so uh, let's groove into the meat of this episode, uh, and let's have a little introduction here for Tom, who, um, as I mentioned up top, is the lead rules designer for Lancer, um, as well as co-founder of Massive Press. But for people who, I guess, don't know you or don't know about the game or Massive Press or anything like that, um, Tom, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Tom Bloom. I'm a uh, comic artist and game designer, and uh, I, I think people most know me for my webcomic, Kill Six Billion Demons, um, and also mm -hmm. for being the primary rules designer and also primary artist of, uh, of Lancer RPG. I have also written other games. I've written uh, a game called Malagas, which is a like necromancer tabletop <laughs> skirmish war game, which I released last year. I write a bunch of other smaller RPGs I released on my Patreon, and... Uh, I am also working on I'm working on two other RPG games right now for release probably next year and the year after. Um, so I'm always like working on stuff. I have a disease where I just have to like get all the ideas out of my head and turn them into like games or comics or whatever. So <laughs> it's uh yeah. it's uh it's it's pretty consistent and it makes me very tired. But uh but uh, I have a lot of work out there and I'm very happy about that. So I was gonna say um, I know about Malagas. I know you're also working on. Um... Oh, Icon is why a am I big one. Icon, yes. Icon yeah, is the big one. I'm, one. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing Icon. I'm releasing a, a which is like a, a JRPG um, style tactics uh, tabletop RPG. Kind of, kind of like Lancer. I think if you like Lancer, you probably like Icon a lot. Though um, it's going to go through a lot of rework. Like I, I'm feeling there's a lot of issues with it. I'm going to have to work on it. Probably won't be coming out in any substantial form until next year. Before that, I'm also working on a narrative uh, led game about playing exorcists working for a international supernatural <laughs> hunting organization called Kane hunting psychic ghost monsters made of human trauma so that's pretty fun I've been doing that uh so that's I coming was, out this I, year I was gonna say I mean like you're also like pretty fire on the tweets and stuff and you also put out a lot of cryptic <laughs> shit all the time <laughs> that's right that's right you gotta cultivate man you gotta cultivate that's it you gotta you can't be you can't be putting out boring fucking posts all the time, man. You gotta you gotta you gotta have a vibe. Yeah. <laughs> you, you do you do have like the wildest vibes and the the craziest takes all the time. But I appreciate oh, it you. because it's always entertaining when you were like post. I'm like, oh sick, Tom post something. What is what other what nonsense is it this time? Like <laughs> <laughs> people hated him for his post, but he spoke the truth. <laughs> he spoke the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. So yeah, okay, cool. I'm glad that you talked about Kane because I was like, I don't even get what's happening, but I love it. Like <laughs> that's coming out soon, so it'll be it'll be demystified very shortly. Nice, nice. Super excited for that. I to be, okay. If it's not obvious, I'm a big fan of all the things you do. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah, I definitely um, binge uh, Kill Six Billion Demons when I found out uh, what it was. <laughs> um, because, like, it was when Lancer was in the Kickstarter, and then I was like, what is Kill Six Billion Demons? And then I read it, and they couldn't put it down. I think it's one of the coolest things um, I've, ex you know, read in a long time. And, oh, thank like, you, you know, very I'm a much. Big, yeah, I'm a big, like, manga fan. I'm a big shonen nerd and, and that kind of stuff. But, like, uh, I think that uh, it's... I, I wish that more stuff was cool like yours. Is that weird? <laughs> it's like, I was like, <laughs> I have, like, a really, really cool uh take on like what does it mean to ha live in a crazy world and do crazy things but also have like normal ass emotions and wants and needs um, mm, high praise thank that, you uh yeah uh, yeah i uh that, that's actually the main thing i've been doing for like 10 years now and i, I think it's funny that like lots took off the way it, it did because like it's very much been like a hobby project for me for a long time or it was uh, back in the day now it's like my second job but i didn't intend it to be so <laughs> That's, that's always like that's a good problem i guess right mm -hmm. <laughs> uh well let's get into lancer a bit actually because I, I was sort of wondering about you know your inspirations for the game and how mm. the how the game just i guess developed over time um because yeah. we, it's like a pretty big uh tabletop game yeah um, yeah it's I, gone very I'm popular sure yeah, yeah. It, con it continues to pick up popularity too which is a crazy thing to me it's like we really we, we did the kickstarter like maybe like uh, five or six years ago now, and it's still picking up steam, which is cool. Yeah, like I I'm just wondering like what 
goes into making something like this um, that not only explodes in popularity, but is also a pretty large game in and of itself. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, what, what do you guys do? You, do you guys want to hear the the like how do we started it or like what the inspirations well, well, were? Or... So, so from an old Dragon Kid video, uh, mm. he said that you just Miguel just reached out to you and he was like, "Hey, man, I'm working on some weird sci-fi robot shit. You want in?" And then you said yes. So is that uh, true? Yeah. No, no, it's not actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, so 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 uh, so Miguel Miguel and I, uh, who's the co-writer, boss. He's a, he's the the writer, right? He he uh, he's he's a creative writer. He's a creative writer by trade. He works for uh, Wizards of the Coast right now. So he hasn't been able to work in Lancet for many years, unfortunately, which kind of sucks. But uh, is what it is. Um, he he uh, was in school for creative writing at the time, and was like, we were like trying to figure out a mech game to play. I, I I've actually known him for for twenty twenty two years at this point, um, and I I met him in middle school playing. Uh, D and D third edition, if that gives you an idea mm. of like <laughs> of like how long I've known that guy, and we were roommates in Portland, Oregon, for a bit, and uh, and we were like, hey, uh, we want to play a mech game, but we're looking at our options, and it was like BattleTech, or um, like some had the support of a Gundam thing, or like I think mm. uh, Beam Saber was in beta back then, and, like that was kind of PPTA, so like I wasn't really feeling it. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of options, so I, I just finished writing a, a, a RPG for my comic, which, by the way, is not a particularly good game. You can go check it out, but it's not—it's not a great PPTA. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, cool. I just—I just finished the game. Like, we, we could go write a, our own game, right? Like, I, I'm—I'm yeah. I'm into this. Like, you—you can—you can write fiction for it, and we'll just like release this. So, we—we we started doing it, and then we got like really into it because like we, we were living together. So he was his room was like across the hall from me, from me, and I would like write some shit and then I'd like go across the hall and knock in his door and be like yo I drop stuff like we worked in a, in a Google Doc for a while um, mm. so like it was purely for our own like interest and our own use right but like the thing I've always done was to put my work online for people to check out right that's 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 how I've always operated I've always tried to put it out for free and for yeah. online just people to try so we put the beta out for free and um, I already had an audience from KSBD and I think a lot of people found Monster through that and then we were just like we literally just had it in a Google Drive <laughs> for a long time and we're like hey check it out and uh, over time we had a very large playtesting community that eventually became the main uh, Lancer server pilot net um, that developed and so we had about two years of that just like being an open open beta basically playtesting it trying out things and then eventually it hit a point with that where we were like uh man this is like finished enough we put enough work into this we could probably kickstart this and then we weren't going to print it but then like people were just like extremely horny for a print <laughs> and we were like <laughs> we should probably print it and so we, we got some quotes and some shipping quotes and stuff and we were like cool we probably will need about this amount of money for for like a thousand book print um but then we quickly, I think, outstripped that by about 10 times, <laughs> which was crazy. So uh, it definitely showed that there was, like, a ton of interest in, in like, yeah. a, a, a mech game that was, like, you know, the kind of game the Lancer is. And I think it's it's filled a good niche, and I think it's gotten very popular because of that. So it's uh, it's continued success has been kind of crazy. It's been, been really, uh, really awesome. Big fan. I think, yeah, for sure. I think that, I, you know, I, I would say Lancer is probably the most popular mech game sci-fi based ttrpg out there i think right now point. yeah yeah it's it's the only one that i've really been interested in playing i think i don't think i've looked at beam saver too hard um, yeah yeah but, i think uh, a, lot, a lot of a lot of stuff tends to go too rules late for me or too um too rules heavy too too finicky like BattleTech is way too finicky for me it's just miserable to play <laughs> in practice yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um i definitely battletech was not even on my radar i mean like i'm a i'm like a war gamer too so i have like mm. i play like warhammer and uh, mm. warhammer 40k and stuff like that and like i was like looking at battletech and then i was like mm, i don't know man like, <laughs> like <laughs> it seems like a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so uh yeah i think you i think you struck the right balance obviously with lancer uh, to be fair, the amount of times I've actually talked about Lancer in the last three years, um, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or yeah, much, yeah. Or however much space is filled, it, it's like, uh, it's good. Um, I think that, you know, obviously you had a good project, product and it's working really well. And it, yeah, thank look, you. It's, 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 I will say it's kind of funny, uh, not to interject, but it's, too, it's kind of funny working on this game now because I, I've like moved on in my design and like how, like how I feel about certain things and and uh, I got, I'm still trying to like design or like uh, edit or, or like uh, produce stuff for Lancer right now. And I'm like, damn, man, I should fix this game. It's, it's like not <laughs> it's so much like bad design in it still, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, like you, you once you once you like send everything off to the printers and like you're like, damn. But what if we had one more week though? <laughs> you know, like could I yeah, could yeah, I yeah, fine tune something? There's always something. Well, that, That's why that, you make like yeah, uh, like another version right later on the line. Is that something that you might do? That's right. Like you might just like clear up clear, clean up the rules and stuff. Uh, yeah, I think Miguel and I will, will uh, eventually, and this is a very long-term plan, I, I have no designs on it yet, but like, uh, we will probably do a second edition at some point. Uh, that'll be like in in like many years from now, though. Um, and it'll be a very different game to the original, I think. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, folks can look forward to that, I guess, in a few years. But uh, yeah, that's super cool. Um, I heard that the Nelson was the first uh, mech designed i mean i was wondering like how much of that design kind of kept to the end right to, to the final oh point. yeah yeah is that do you mean to mean mechanics or, or visuals uh all of it <laughs> anything about it yeah 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 so so for a while um we actually only had one mech visual which was the nelson which was on our original um our original like uh playtest stock we just had like the cover and i just drew a mech and i think i was very inspired by like um titanfall and um in like the visual design of it, because I quite like the, the visual design of the mechs there. And uh, I don't know, what was the other thing we really liked? I guess we like we like Battlecycle a lot, too, Miguel and I. Like we used to play uh, Mech Warrior online back in the day. Mm. Like uh, he, he, he I, di I didn't own an Xbox uh, or any kind of game station really uh, that had any internet connectivity. So a lot of my like high school years were spent at his house like playing Halo. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> or, or, true. Or, ba or, or battle set games, whatever. Like that's what we would do. So. I think a lot of the DNA, is, and uh, I think there's a lot of Halo DNA in Launcher too. I will, I will say, uh, actually, in terms of the, the tone and the setting and stuff, it's like very, very Halo influenced, uh, and, and like a Destiny too as well. I, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we had that. We had that. I was that. So it was the first designed, but actually, I think I designed like, I, like the actual design of all the mechs was like really simple. I basically went through and I was like. We need a mech that does this. We need a mech that does this, right? So it's like we need we need a missile mech. We need a you know like a heavy melee mech, and so like that's how I came up with all the original mech designs. So it was the first conception. It was like this is a mech that does this, and then we had like a very simple design for all of them. So I think all of them okay. were designed at once, which I think technically makes like the Blackbeard the first mech that was designed. <laughs> so it's his first on the list there. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, like, I guess you just like what are the niches that mechs can can fill, and then just yeah, kind of yeah, that's that's where it started. Them, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In fact, that was too narrow at first because we had things like um, this is the flying mech, and then of course, like over time, we were like, that's a lame way to design mechs. Like all, all like for a while, it was like because it had the the modularity. What mm -hmm. we intended was for you to look at the. What I intended was for you to look at the mech and be like, this is the flying mech, and I need levels in this mech if I want to fly. But what that ended up being is like it was it was a duskwing, by the way. And yeah, yeah. all the Dust Wings gear was just about flying and had no other identity. It was very boring. <laughs> it was basically like a big a big bucket you would like reach into to get your flight systems, and that was all you would do. And I was like, oh, okay, right. this is a bad way to design to design a, a game. So we ended up moving past that pretty quickly. But you, you still see some elements of that design in like the basic um, design of all the mechs in the game. Like they have a they have a fantasy behind them, right? I think that's yeah. The, I, I know it was funny because you were like the dust wing, by the way, and I was like, yeah, that's the exact one I was thinking about. Yeah, and in yeah, my head, yeah. it's like it is the flying mech. If you want to fly, it, yeah. just jump in the dust wing. Right. Um, yeah. Cool. I, well, yeah, for sure. Uh, you can definitely get lost in the. I, I was gonna say like cookie cutter, almost like factory, like this is this for this kind of stuff. But um, mm -hmm. all of the mechs, I think, are uh, super. I mean, I don't know. The, the, you wrote it. It's good. You know. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so, <laughs> it's so weird. I don't normally get to talk to the writer of stuff, mm. so it's like, mm. ah, you know, I can just gush, but actually, you just know because you wrote it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I always I always believe that my work is good. I think you, you have to because if you don't, you know, what are you doing to yourself? You know, exactly right. Like all that self loathing. Yeah. Like why 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 bother with that? It's gonna yeah, get in the yeah. way of all the stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but it's cool to know that like everything kind of uh, percolated up. Uh, as together, right? So that's really cool. Calvin, you got uh, anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to let you two talk because I know you're really enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, something that I really like to talk about people with is the play testing, um, mm -hmm. how design sort of iterates over time uh, once you start getting feedback from like outside sources. Because 
you know, it's pretty easy to get like into certain design ideas. And then you, once you hear other people's perspective, you know, you might see those things that you didn't notice at first or those maybe gaps that may exist in the design. Mm. Um, so like, what was that part of the development process like? Like just iterating on rules and mechanics um, as you started getting more feedback from like play testing and the Kickstarter and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think playtesting is really important, um, especially if you're going to make a game that is like. Uh, so, so I, I broadly think, and this is just kind of this is very a big picture kind of thing that RPGs are actually in a very strange. Um, they exist in a very strange space, right? Especially ones that have like tactical combat components, because they're simultaneously like a shared collaborative storytelling experience and also a board game that you're playing, right? I don't yeah. think there's actually that much distinction between board games and certain kinds of TTRPGs, um, and because people play them the same way, uh, if, even if we're not thinking about it. We and, and sometimes people like to role play when they're playing, I don't know, Catan or whatever, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Like the, 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 know, there's an element I know of I do for sure. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, or Monopoly or whatever the you know like there's there is like a there's like an element of both of everything in there. I don't think the line between the two is actually as hard as people think. So the thing is like when you have a game that is more of that board game experience as opposed to that like collaborative improv theater experience, then it does require a lot more playtesting. I think it requires a lot more a lot more balancing and stuff. And you'll catch things that are really easy to catch when you have an actual in-person play experience, right? Like I just played Kane recently, and um, it's a game about playing, uh, I'm playtesting it right now, it's about playing like a, a secret organization, right? And and they, they got into a location and because they were from this secret organization, they had the collaboration of the, of the police in the area, right? For an investigation, like a murder investigation. And I, I thought that 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 um, that there was like a lack of friction there that wasn't interesting to me because a lot of the powers you're like you're playing like psychics in Kane, right? A lot of the powers are supposed to be used for like mundane obstacles, right? Like people that might get in your way. And I was like, oh, there's no real use case for these powers if you can just waltz into a scene and have you know collaboration from the authorities immediately by flashing a badge. And you're supposed to be clandestine, so I was like, oh, the cops need to be hostile to you. <laughs> Like you need to you need to be operating without the consent of the police. This is way more yeah. interesting. Also, it means you get to punch cops in Kane, and that's that's fine because you're you're part of a clandestine organization, and that's cool. That's cool and good, and way more interesting. And but it took me playing that in person to to realize that, right? So uh, especially for a game like Monster, where you are playing more of that like board game component, things will just benefit from playtesting so much, man. Like the more you do, the better. I think people are so precious about their work. They're afraid what will happen when when people play it and realize that you know oh this doesn't work the way I want it to and people are playing it wrong you know this and that and it's like you're gonna realize like the the game in practice at the table is the most important form of the game right and you can't get a look at that unless you play test so I'm really glad we did the whole open open testing thing and in fact making it as available as possible I think has been a really smart move in general but uh, yeah we got a ton of feedback over like two years right like just like the game changed drastically from its first initial incarnation I don't know if you guys have ever seen like Lancer have you seen like Lancer 1.0 have you seen like that version of I the game I don't think so I think the only experience of Lancer was like Kickstarter version for me yeah yeah uh, that was like after like two years right so like the initial yeah. version it was was extremely different right so, so the initial version, you know, you know, you have the four stats, the like H A S E of Hayes Hayes stats. Like, the initial version, the met, the frames were literally just a set of number modifications to those stats. Oh. They didn't, they didn't have traits. They didn't have uh, ultimate abilities. They have core abilities. They didn't have um, anything. They were just, the, they were just oh. like, this one can fly, and it has like. Four plus four agility, and here's the gear for it. Right, that was in the first version of the game. Can you imagine yeah. if we'd released that? <laughs> Terrible, <laughs> not interesting, yeah. completely yeah. useless. But no, then no uh, vibes. Yeah, over time, no vibes, no spice. That's, that's, no that's, vibes that's, at that's all. Cool. Yeah, fucking dry yeah. ass sandwich of a game. And then, and then, you know, like over time, I was like, we need to delineate these more. And I invented the trait system and the fucking core powers and all that shit. And that's become like a really key component of the system. But that didn't start with it. If I just fucking sat in my in my like goblin hole and and made this game how I originally envisioned it, it would have sucked. I needed to expose yeah. it to the internet first. And people would look, tell me it sucks. And I go, cool, I should change that. <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah, well it's good yeah. to know it's good to know that you're just not a genius. Uh that No, no man. <laughs> that, you, that you are that you are immortal like the rest of us. That's pretty Well, that's pretty you, nice you learn you learn iteratively, right? You learn by by 
by working and making work and then you expose your work to error and then you get feedback in it and then you continue to iterate right that's that's how you do anything right like you you, you don't yeah. you don't learn to become a piano maestro by just playing to yourself <laughs> right yeah like yeah for sure like you might get really proficient at some things but like you're never gonna you're never gonna be a good performer because you don't know what a playing in front of an audience is like of course, of course. I think that's just like a good life lesson in general. And like, I think a lot of people get really, uh, well, especially, I would say, um, I was gonna say especially, but like specifically like in tabletop RPGs and stuff like that, like uh, even just playing the game and like even trying to GM or like doing new stuff, there's all this fear of failure mm. associated with it. And it's like, nah, man, just go for it. And if you fail, like who cares? You guys are all hanging out, having fun. Uh, with your friends, right? Like, it's not that big of a deal. And uh, you'll just change and get better and at, at whatever you're doing, so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's definitely, it's a huge block a lot of people have to work through. You gotta realize, like, I, I, I am, you know, a very self-actualized person in terms of, like, my work and my desires and things, and it's, like, really hard to get to that point. Like, don't, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, man, but, like, I, I do <laughs> think it is really important to, to yeah, to, to, to play test your work, man, to, like, show it to other people, to, like, get it, get it around, so, like, like that's the only way you're going to improve is is, is through that stuff. I, I do believe in, in playtesting. So I'm really glad we did the whole process and like all, all my games are like that. I, I test all my games now like extensively. <laughs> Not they didn't before, yeah. but yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's how you got to fine tune product. Uh, obviously, uh, at Lancer is proof that it, it has both vibes and is fine tuned enough to, to, you know, pass all of the, the, the checks and stuff like that. So mm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, you, you did mention, like, you know, not being so stuck in your ideas that it feels like you're basically, like, making it in a cave with no other eyes yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, I, that kind of leads into another thing that I wanted to talk about, which mm. is, you know, working with, like, third-party writers and creators and artists and all that. Like, there's a bunch of, um, like, from our experience, we know there's a bunch of, like, other stuff that people have written for Lancer. Um, yeah, You yeah. know, modules, settings, uh, new mechs, uh, new you know gear that people can take on um and something i was just really interested in is like you know like sort of your view on that like seeing what people are adding to the game not just at their own tables but what they're sharing with like the entire community yeah i think it's sick as fuck <laughs> i love i love that i think that's part of the lancia's continuous uh popularity is that there's like a lot of fan content made for the game i think i think um i think part of that is just like the the rules are um i, th I think part of the game's continuous success is that like the rules are both consistent and um, and like uh, modular, right? It's very clear what mm. a piece of content for the game looks like, right? And uh, and also like that, the, yeah, that like open. You can download the rules for the game for free, um, and and I think that's a huge a huge thing. I think a lot of people check it out and go, cool, I want to make stuff for this. <laughs> so yeah. it's nice. I'm, I'm I'm a huge fan of the fan content. We've we've been hiring uh, people from the community to write first party third party content. Um, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, um, and that's been really successful. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm because uh, we we just had traits to talk about uh, like a couple podcast episodes ago about mm. uh, Siren Song, which is yeah, cool. yeah. I mean, it is cool. Yeah, yeah that was it. that was really dope. Um, right now, he's actually running me through uh, Kaite's um, Solstice Rain right now. Oh yeah, so yeah, that's, that's that's super dope. And uh, I I just uh, yeah, I, the way that you preface it, where it's like the rules are so easily understandable and like free that you're just like, oh, I, I, I can understand how to design a cool gun or something or like this mech can work this way or whatever based on, you know, how it is and yeah. it just fit right into the world, right? Or like the system and settings and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not necessarily like a, a, a rules like Game Monster. Right? I, I think it's it can take, a, especially with someone who's not used to these kinds of games, like it, it, can, it can be a little bit to get into, but like the actual content right like fra frames like you want to design a frame it's like what do you need you need a couple traits you need a core power and you need yeah. some like base stats and like that's that's like not difficult to kind of like grok right like the fan the, the fantasy being a thing that is like a little package it's like it's like um designing like a subclass for D, &D right like they what i don't i don't really like D, &D for the edition i think I've, I've made that very public on my <laughs> on my facing all my i my, my official you know socials and stuff but one of the things i think it actually does do really well is it does the D, &D class fantasy thing very well so um you know you think about a D, &D class it has it's a good package of like abilities and effects and things that are like flavorful and interesting and you're like oh this is awesome 
Like, I, I know what yeah. this does. Everyone, everyone knows what a paladin does, right? And so it's very easy to, to visualize your own content and say, like, I want to make a guy that uses guns. What's he going to need? Oh, he's going to need this, this, and this. Cool. Like, that's that's a, that's a big virtue of a game. So I always try to design my games with, like, that in mind. They always need, like, like um, a very strong fantasy that you can encapsulate in, like, a package. I think I've taken a lot of influence from video games in that regard, right? Like... Players should be able to like see and feel the vibes when they are picking a cho making a choice in the game. They should know what they're doing without even having to understand what the rules are, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just based on like their initial reaction to it, or like initial reading of it, being like, oh, what is, yeah. you know, just kind of going through the content. You don't have to know like how exactly every single melee attack works, or like yeah. what even all the tags mean. Yeah, just that, yeah. You like, want, you want you the know. juice. You want the juice, man. You need the juice. That's what it is. 100%. For sure. For sure. Yeah, okay. So just just vibes forward. Uh play vibes test forward. very often. Yes. And uh don't don't be afraid to just kind of give away your shit for free until it's yep. done, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on that on that note, I think that's a really successful way of distributing things. I, I like um the the internet, like the one virtue of it is like it's it's free distribution network, right? Mm -hmm. Of of immense size. And the freer and more accessible your stuff is, the more people you're going to reach. So I've always operated on a model of like, give people shit for free and ask them to pay for you, pay, pay you later for it. Um, because basically the marketing will then do itself because people can just dip in and, and try your own thing. I've never, we've never, we've, we, sorry, we marketed Philancer uh, once during the Kickstarter. We actually did a marketing buy. I think it's the only time we've ever done any marketing for the game at all. Everything else has been word of mouth. Um, and why not, dude? Like if someone tells you to play Lancer today, what do you have to do? One person has to own the game to run it as a GM. That's twenty-five dollars. Then yeah. five people can go download the free version, and they can download CompCon and build characters instantly, and plug in content from anything, right? <laughs> right? That's player-facing without having to give yeah. us any money. And so it's really easy uh, to, to do that and do like like ten times. And the player goes, maybe I should buy a copy of the core book. And now you have someone who's like, you know, normally would like go pirate your shit, and and instead they're just going to give you money, which is which is. Uh, which is great. It's yeah. great for both of us because they get to we get we get the support which feels earned, right? And and a community of people who are playing it because I mean, especially for an RPG, you want more people to be playing your game, right? You want more people to be fucking engaging with it. And if there's a money barrier there, you're gonna have less people playing the game, right? Um, yeah. And we get you know we get that community that will support us and stuff, and it, and it feels like it, it is real support because it's it's us giving giving things out and getting support in return. It's an earned respect, right? It's not just like asking for money to like participate in this thing it's like no dude like have it for free support us if you feel like it and i think a lot of people do feel like doing that that's why models like patreon work because like i i don't paywall any of my comic for example right i just update yeah. every week and people have come to expect that of me so when they give me money on patreon they're like well i'm i can see the product like this guy can work in this comic full time and and that becomes like uh, a relationship of support rather than a monetary relationship that is one between like you know company and consumer which is something that we'd never want to fall into so okay anyway, yeah yeah, I mean, yeah try that out put I, your shit out for free <laughs> try it i was gonna say like, i was gonna say it worked it got me to buy the book twice apparently uh -huh. that's that's how much i was there, like there is yeah I was, I was like hyped i was like yeah oh, I'll buy this yeah, book. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and there's one there's one caveat to that which is like of course you can't do that and make money off of it initially, right? You need to establish that relationship. You need to establish that community. And so, like, Miguel and I did this while having other jobs, right? And I did my comic while having another job uh, when I was putting on, like, free Patreon and stuff, so on and so forth. So it's not really a sustainable strategy starting out. You have to really work in it, um, which can be a big barrier to a lot of people, right? Um, expected to do a lot of work and not see a cent for it for many years is, like, you know, a hard ask for a lot of people who don't have the privilege or the time to, to do that but uh i don't know i think it's a successful strategy for things like games comics that kind of stuff so yeah yeah I, I, especially because like you know otherwise you would require some sort of publisher money interjection right that you have that you know, no don't that. do that don't do that no don't fuck do it that. no go <laughs> no go no what okay honestly honest swear to god I, I i actually think i think the future of a lot of content media content in general is peer-to-peer -peer. And okay. I really, yeah. I really strongly believe that. I, I really think that like the publisher company backed media content, like get games, tabletop games especially. I think video games, you, you know, it's a lot like movies and stuff. You still need a lot of people to work together. It's like you can't really decentralize that. But things like comics, uh, TTRPGs, things that you can do in small groups, like 
do you know peer to peer? I think is the future of that shit uh, for sure. I, I don't think you need companies to 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 do it or big yeah, companies that's, anyway. That's kind of how I feel. I mean, I know that you're playing. You mentioned that you're playing Pathfinder Second Edition, right? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Pa- we, we that's like basically the other than Lancer, um, we also just play that game a lot as well. Mm. Um, I I do find like I kind of. As weird as it sounds, it's like it's like I I never touch D and D because it's like yeah that company is actually just bad, um, not the people who work there, just the company is bad. Uh, right. But for some reason I'm like Pathfinder two, uh, the, the Pathfinder people like they're probably better. I mean they feel a lot better, they feel a lot more commutative. But like, I think you're right. I think the smaller like the the, the smaller the team, just support a bunch of tables of RG creators uh, who are just trying to do this for the for the love of of it and like wants to get paid yeah. too. Is yeah, hundred percent. It's definitely the future, it, for sure. For 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 the indie scene, anyway, I think for sure. Don't yeah. don't. I I would just say to people who are like listening to this, like don't don't wait or tr- or try to get like published by somebody. J- just like make your stuff and like put it out there. Like do it yourself, you know. And just just keep it up. That's all. I, I think eventually you'll find success if you do the work and put the work in. You know. Yeah. yeah. Like once you start building that base with people, like once you start have like once you have that trust and people can see that you are developing something that they are either enjoying or that you're responding to their feedback at the very least and developing into something they'll enjoy. I think it would be easier at that point, you know, to get to that step of, you know, being them responding uh, with like either some sort of payment or something like that. If you like, depending on what your options are there. Um, whether you're kickstarting it, whether you have like a Patreon or whatever, yeah. once you build that trust with people, they're more likely to jump that, uh, like you know, cross that bridge. I should say. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's just about like putting out consistent work, and and uh, and being a participant in the community and like, yeah, taking feedback and you know doing stuff like that, for sure. Um, well, actually, because you just mentioned uh, persistent work, <laughs> um, something you how, said. How do we get here? How do we get in this tangent? <laughs> <laughs> oh, tangents are my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you did mention something uh, near the top of the podcast that was kind yeah. of stuck in my head and I wanted to touch on because you mentioned, you know, you have these ideas and you want to work on them. You want to get them out. You want to put them in something that I guess other people can see. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm kind of wondering, I don't know if this is, I don't know how per, how personal this might be, but like your process for that because, you know, there, there's a lot of people out there who have a lot of really good ideas. I think everybody has good creative ideas in them but not everybody yes. gets them out not everybody you know yes. writes them down or draws them or you know whether it's like i don't know music or movies or anything like that not everybody puts their ideas out into the world uh-huh, or yeah. can make those steps um i don't know it's it's in from in my head it's not even like usually a matter of capability sometimes like sometimes people just don't do the thing and i'm kind of wondering like what your process is like as someone who has those ideas and wants to get them out yeah, yeah. I mean, so let me let me just like um, add a caveat first to say, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like I've been supporting on Patreon now for like eight years. So I, and, and I'm probably uh, I'm easily like one of the most highly paid comic creators in 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 the U.S. I think, but by Patreon numbers anyway, I, I think I'm number five or six or something. So, like I, I have I have like the the like financial freedom to like focus on weird projects, right, <laughs> and not be like. Sure working yeah. on, uh, like uh so tightly at a nine to five or a, a, like at a teaching job like i used to where i d- wouldn't have any free time like I, I have a young child you know and like that's already taken up enough time but i i have enough time like i can take an hour or so at night or in the morning or whatever it's like work another shit right like I, I can i can work on these projects like um without without my financial freedom being compromised so that, that that's the that's the caveat right and mm-hmm. while I was working on KSBD and on Lancer and all that, like I, I had savings and stuff from from working at a teaching job in in Japan, so I was working a a regular full time job while I was doing all this other stuff on the side, right? And you know, there's people who like have a lot of other stressors in their life and aren't like you know able bodied white dudes like me who like you know have a lot of like a lot less like obstacles to overcome when it comes to that stuff, and. Uh, and so yeah, that that's all the disclaimers at the start here, right? <laughs> um, but but which are big ones, right? But but the thing is, like, I think a lot of what people don't think about is like there's there's two things, right? One one is that ideas are actually worthless, right? They're worthless because they're, they're not actualized in any way, right? So 
they're not they're not worth anything and unless you're somebody who has a relationship with a hollywood producer and then maybe they're worth something <laughs> but they don't they don't give you anything like the, the what the value is the value is in the work mm. the value is in the work and it always will be in the work so doing the work is the only way to actually make a product that people can interact with engage with and can can like get it out there right and and so the work itself is the project is is whatever you're trying to make in practice it is not the idea in fact you will often discover that your idea will change and, and grow and adapt based on the work that you're doing until like like it did with me and Lancer until like you mm. know the end product is something completely different because because the process of production has shaped it right all all art is a process of production if if it was just ideas right every movie would be an insane spectacle right that that, that a, a go, like a godly spectacle that, that we'd be weeping by the end of it or whatever but unfortunately we have you know fucking work hours and uh safety regulations and a fucking budget right. <laughs> yeah yeah and so and so the art art is a product of the medium and of and of the production process and 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 ttrpgs comics games whatever they are, there's no exception right uh, it, it is the work. The work is the work, right? That's what it is. It's not the idea that is behind it. So the only way to learn to do that is to do the work, and to, and to, and in any way that is, where whether you're working on it, thirty minutes, forty-five minutes at a time, a day, getting a consistent schedule, you have to you work up discipline to like work on stuff. You got to do it. You got to put the work okay. in. You got to put the hours in, and then you, then you will learn what what it looks like. You will learn what your craft is. You would never expect, yeah. and I used the piano example earlier because I love fucking using it because I'm I'm because I'm, I'm basic like that, right? If if someone says I want to learn piano, you would <laughs> you would tell them to go practice piano, right? You wouldn't say read a bunch of piano books and and uh, re read the music and imagine it in your head or whatever, right? You know, you'd be like, no, dude, fucking get your hours in, like get your fingers on the keys, motherfucker, <laughs> like get in there. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you're yeah. Trying to teach, yeah. Learn how to teach piano. You're trying to play piano so just get play a fucking do it right do it get a works get a work schedule get get a consistent hours right if you're writing right every day if it's 30 yeah. minutes right every day you hear this from lots of people it's 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 and the reason that they don't do it is it's really fucking hard it's really hard to keep that discipline up yeah, but you have I to know. do it because otherwise you know it's not going to get made and the other thing i'll say the other caveat is that um like a lot of it is uh you'll you'll hear you know you hear like people get frustrated because they're putting, they're doing work, they're putting work out there and they're not getting any response to it or traction or whatever. And the thing is like success and uh, actualizing whatever you're trying to work on takes a very long time. And sometimes there's a significant luck component and, and you just have to be kind of, you know, in the right place at the right time or whatever. And, and so it, it kind of sucks, but like you're not going to get that chance unless you, keep the hard work up even if there's no outcome from it even if there's no response to it or no feedback or whatever you can't rely on that dopamine from getting like people responding to your stuff you just have to keep mm. doing it like a crazy person right with no 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 expectation as to the outcome because you only get to roll the dice if you're putting the hours in yeah i if i was you, gonna say you, there, yeah there's like a there's like a uh this the saying I have in my head um, is like, you know, uh, success is actually just skill plus luck over time. Yes. Right? Like that's that's actually the equation and people don't really, people forget about the time part. People forget yeah. about the luck part. And all they yeah. see is like, oh, if only if I had the skill. Um, yeah. And as well as like people don't get that like you might have an idea of what's, what it is to like live that life or do that thing. But they don't see like all of the idea that oh actually doing the work will show you if you enjoy this or not right like you only have so much yeah. time in your life if you just sit there yeah. being like only if i can do all this cool stuff i'll be happy but actually yeah. you don't even know if it's going to make you happy just do it you don't find out. you don't and, and it's and it kind of sucks like uh, i do comic books and i think that's actually that sort of prepared me for 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 like the sort of like solo creative life because comics is incredibly fucking hard right every page of comics i draw takes me like somewhere between six to ten hours to finish yeah. and uh, someone will look at it for 45 seconds right <laughs> but i but i i i draw i and then sometimes you know it takes this is, this is not like thinking about a nine to five as in i'm only working three hours of the day the rest of the day i'm checking email or i'm having lunch or whatever i'm talking about ass in the chair drawing six to ten hours right and uh and and people can sometimes balk at that and they they bounce off of it because it's very difficult and uh 
and they don't realize that like the only only way you make a comic book is one page at a time over many many years or months or however long it is and you just have to put the hours in but then then the outcome on the other end is you, you know you have a comic which is fucking awesome um, and it's the same for like anything else like ttrpgs too you just gotta write you gotta make stuff you gotta put it out there and uh you know eventually you, i think the thing is like if you're smart about doing that like you will you will find success with it you just have to be consistent about it you can't like give up and you can't like get rebuffed by you can't get rebuffed by like the reception or lack of reception or whatever the other thing is i'd also ask people to, to determine whether they're trying to do something seriously as a career or as a way to make money or uh try they're trying to design something for sale as opposed to a hobby right mm -hmm. if it's just a hobby and you're just doing it for yourself you don't have to be so harsh on yourself about it right whatever just make just just fucking design it for fun right but if you want to take it seriously you're going to have to do it for long hours you're going to have to do it when you don't want to do it when you'd rather be hanging out with people at 10 p.m on a friday night and if that's something that you can like tolerate and you're a certain kind of person you can definitely do it but but like you have to realize that's the reality of the situation and it's okay just to say like i'm making this for me i'm not making this to like kickstart right yeah right. um and uh but if you but if you are trying to do it seriously you know you have to be consistent about it and uh that's the only thing that's going to bring you measured success is just putting the fucking hours in man and it sucks <laughs> it yeah, sucks you, it, it does suck <laughs> yeah i mean that's 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 me it's like i i i draw i have a i have i work from I work in hours from, uh, from from nine to nine to four on the weekdays, and then sometimes I work in the evening. Not 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 typically nowadays, though, because I have kids. Um, right. And uh, but like like doing doing like uh, my comic stuff. At the, you know, I used to stay up till like three in the morning, and I, I would I would uh, I would like do my regular nine to five like school teaching job or like eight, eight to five. And I'd come back, I'd eat dinner, and then I draw from seven to one sometimes and i'm not saying you have to do that <laughs> i don't recommend it actually but like that's how i got my start right that was like doing that on on three days a week doing one page a week that was my that was yeah. my capacity for it um, yeah yeah it's, it's like this is like the the realistic thing of like how tom bloom made the kick-ass comic book right it's yeah and, and, like, and, and, just, you, you, what you, you did yeah <laughs> yeah you can you can also you don't have to do it that hard you, you can stretch that out over time I mean, you can just look at like lancer and be like well we wrote this game but we wrote it over two years with public playtesting right it was a long time it was a lot of work and a lot of words and it took us a fucking long time to finish it but we but we did it like we were writing like every week yeah in the morning so i would, I would write i write like two or three hours and i would do that like three three days a week and then you know eventually we had a book so yeah for sure. I, I, yeah, the, the analogy would be like you just build a house a brick at a time and eventually it's, it's done. You do, and it sucks because pe people people go like, man, why is my house not built yet? And you're like, well, it's going to take you like 300 more bricks, dude. <laughs> and they go, what the fuck? And you go, yeah, that's just how it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the most like deferred gratification. You almost have to be massive fucking pissed about it, dude. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, but 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 that's that's the way shit gets made, and that's the reality of it, right? That's that is actually everything cool that you've ever consumed. Every piece of media, every every piece of art, every piece of clothing on your fucking body has been made through labor. It did not magically appear because someone had a cool idea. Labor went into it, motherfucker. Work put work went into it. So do, you got to do it. You got to do it. Yeah. You got you to gotta do it. Yeah. Okay. That that makes a little bit more sense. I know there was a tweet the other day where you, you like <laughs> mentioned it and i was like you gotta put the work in and now thank you, you for explaining that tweet you do you, do. <laughs> you do gotta put the work in man you do actually it sucks it sucks ass no one likes that no one likes that fact man it sucks that's why the ai guys are all out here they're like what if i could just fucking type a prompt in it's like fuck off <laughs> fuck know. off dude those dudes instant gratification those... fucking ipad kid vibes you fucking Mush brains, smooth brain, motherfucker. Can I swear on this podcast? I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if Spotify will like it, but I'll just, <laughs> just bleep, bleep me out. Bleep me out. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna say, um, like continuing your house metaphor. Like, I, I think, and maybe this might tie into the AI discussion a bit. I think sometimes people miss like the frame that went into the house, and all they see is the completed house. You know, they miss yeah. the foundation and everything. You didn't make a house, motherfucker. You didn't do it. You didn't. You didn't make a house. You didn't do it. You didn't do the work at all. You didn't learn anything. Nothing has happened here. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what I'm saying. Pe people fetishize it, but the, but the, but actually the, the 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 act of creation is the creation, right? That's it. The act. It's in the action. It's not in the yeah. idea. 
Yeah. It's like it's yeah. like if a whole cast of ideas guys suddenly realized that they could like jerk themselves off instantly by pressing a button. It sucks. I hate it. Anyway, <laughs> it's an anti AI. You know you know my stance in AI. I don't have to fucking. <laughs> yeah, it seems pretty clear. <laughs> like, Cal- Calvin's, Calvin's gonna like tag in the YouTube Brock being like Tom's <laughs> rant on AI. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not, uh, uh, you, you stop me from getting into a digression right now before we get into dangerous territory. We gotta move on. <laughs> okay. All right. Well. Heck, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that, uh, like, I don't know. I, I actually have just some curious questions for myself. I have, like, yeah. okay, it's so all this Kane stuff, right? Like, yeah. is this, are you, like, I, I'm going to try and get for the backstory, like, that backstory, the inspiration from it. Is, is this from, like, uh, Chainsaw Man? It has a lot of Chainsaw Man vibes. Is that, oh, is that yeah, yeah, like, yeah. the suits, right? The suits are, Yeah, like, dude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, uh, I, what I noticed is that there, there is, um... It's interesting that there's like the uh, there's a cadence to these like um, kind of uh, investigatory shonen battle comics that are out there like Jujutsu Kaisen and Chainsaw Man. Yeah. Um, that is quite quite consistent, and I was like, how can I make a game that replicates that? Um, so it's an investigation game that that kind of mimics those uh, those uh, the cadence of those shonen comics, I would say. So you can use it to run like a yeah like a anywhere from like a sort of like weird X Files analog to like yeah, like a Jujutsu Kaisen kind of thing. Of course, yeah, because I mean, like it kind of does like the monster of the week thing, right? Where it's like, oh, yeah, there's, a, there's something bad happening in like Boston. Go, go to Boston and go figure yes. it out, right? Go talk to the yeah. the bodega or whatever, and just be like, oh yeah, yes. yeah, okay, yeah. Has like yeah. has a, has like a it's a it's a, yeah it's like a it's like if Call of Cthulhu got mixed up with Evangelion and Chainsaw Man. That's kind of how I would describe it. Um, oh. That that is a vibe, I I because I'm always I'm always like wanting to play like call like uh, Cthulhu and S games and stuff like that, but I'm like, mm. eh. I mean, it's not cool enough because of the lack of agency. I think I think it's just kind of like I want to also you know shout loudly and attack people yeah. with swords while also being freaked out by all the tentacles at the same time, right? Got that nice yeah. balance of like of like like you know action agency and like oh shit we're in over our head kind of deal oh yeah yeah it's it's uh it's very much about being the, the tools of like uh of like a big evil illuminati organization that is also trying to like wipe out a bunch of ghost monsters it has huge ava vibes because i fucking love ava so yeah i can tell uh <laughs> i guess i was gonna also say um i heard that you uh you also just designed all of the horus like you put a lot of effort in that one because like mm. that is just that's just weird ava max to the max. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I designed all the mechs in the game, um, Sorry, from visuals I, I, to the mechanics. But 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 uh, Horus, I'm most responsible for the lore for that one. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I meant to say yeah, yeah. that that uh, that that part. Yeah. Yeah. When you look for at Lancer, when you look at like anything kind of uh, mill mil sci-fi, um, or if there's a mysterious monolith involved, that's Miguel. And if you look at anything okay. that's like, there's a monkey with a beer here. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah nice okay yeah, good that's, that's the rule I, I was gonna say i'm glad that you know miguel's bringing out the the weird round space object that's causing all the problems yeah yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. If, 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 it, if it seems like it should be in halo that's miguel and if it's like if it's like uh like a weird like mobius comic vibe then that's probably me all right cool or, cool. or it's horace that, that's the other thing i did a lot of horace <laughs> stuff or it's horace yeah yeah interesting so uh what what did, I think we're kind of getting close to the end of this. Um, Calvin, is there anything else you want to you want to jump in in here? I mean, I, I was kind of curious about what your Pathfinder Two E game is. But yeah, actually, know. yeah, yeah. Oh. What, are you, what are you doing in Pathfinder? <laughs> oh, Just I well, want to hear uh, talk about Pathfinder. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I mean, so I, I I had a group. We were, we were like, I'm quite sick. Of, I've run a Five E quite a lot. D and D Five E quite a lot. And um, I think the thing that happens with uh, with games over time, all, all games actually, is you, you play them enough that you get used to their contours and uh, they become kind of stale for you, right? I, I think it's kind of weird, right? We, we kind of expect people to go like, well, I've been playing Halo 1 multiplayer for, for five years and, uh, and I'm pretty sick of it. <laughs> I want Halo 2 to come out. But then people go like, I... I, uh, I've been playing this one game system, RPG game system, for, for six years, and I'm still loving it. Right? It's like, no, it's kind of weird. Like, 
you know, people people can figure out the shape of a game, especially when it's like a board gamey game, like uh, like Five E can be, right? Right. Um, and, and and even like Blades in the Dark, my favorite game ever. I've run two, two like year plus campaigns of that. I've been I've been a player in one, and I, I ran one myself. And we finished those campaigns, and, and they were fucking great, and I've had a great experience with them. We now run three ga- three long campaigns of Blades, and at this point, I can safely say I think all my entire group that, that plays Blades is, is like tired of that game. <laughs> like we know we know what's strong, we know what's weak, we know what the, the cadence of the game is like. Like we're ready to play something else. So so we, we were ready for that with Five E a long time ago. I, I have since become very disillusioned with the game past about level five or so because I, I think it has mm. massive issues um, and it's very mid <laughs> in general. Especially in its way that, like, like uh, you know, it just like the the way that like magic solves a lot of the narrative and takes tension out of things yeah. and the, the weird rules yeah, and consistencies but... and it's just like it's just like not well well designed. Um, and, and so uh, we were looking for a new game to play, and I was like, I was trying this Pathfinder thing out because I think it was a good fit for my group. I was trying to find something more rules light, like um, oh, that's like, like the uh, opposite, que- <laughs> like quest. No, I know, but I was, oh, I was trying to find something more rules light, like like quest or or or. Uh, or um, or fucking uh, uh, fellowship, and I was also thinking about something like um, OSR even. But then I was like oh, looking okay. at those games, and I'm like, these are not a good fit for my group because they they like the they like the kind of crunchy rules shit to some degree. They like the tactical yeah, yeah. combat component. So I was like, uh, let's 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 try that. So uh, so we're gonna try we try Pathfinder. I'm like not loving how rules. It's it, it seems like it's it's built for a certain kind of grognard, and that kind of guy is a dude that loves third edition D anD. d It's like it's like an alternate evolution of of D anD. d If if like three E had remained the the like yeah. c- the like edition everyone was playing, but had like evolved from like modern sensibilities a little bit, and was more balanced. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like with all the sort of weird weird idiosyncrasies of third edition. Like, why the fuck yeah. do shields have hardness and fucking <laughs> HP and shit? <laughs> like, why do I have to take an action to put a shield up? Like, God, this is so fucking hey, clunky. I would say it's, got, it's because, it's fucking it's because the, fighter, the fighter needs to look cool when he pulls it up as a reaction. <laughs> like, that's, that's right, that's right. It's 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 very strange. But, uh, but the nice thing yeah. is, it, it is a game with rules that actually, like, work. And yeah. <laughs> uh, and and are well written and delineated and like not yeah. vague and uh, and so I really appreciate that like I like that a lot it's caused my game to go a lot smoother in some regards. Um, than I would I say that 5D. the I would say the new stuff that Pathfinder Second Edition is putting out now with like their Rage of Elements books and like the new class of Kineticus is like where the sweet spot is. It's like yeah. it feels like all of that like the shield thing that you were talking about like that kind of goes away and it's a little bit more like fun and free form and just kind of very like... uh fourth edition inspired too so i think yeah. that's, a, that's a definitely a boon for sure um when anything when anything comes out and there's like cool abilities you pick up and you get a bunch of them per level i'm like ooh, my sicko meter activates i'm like there it is yeah the yeah, children the... want fourth edition the children want fourth edition <laughs> is no one listening to me <laughs> I feel like you know, we have multiple times heard someone like compliment fourth edition when we have them on the show. <laughs> the thing is, w- wizards will never make it because it's just not. It's not like uh, they got such a big backlash from the, from the fucking usual crowd, and it sold so poorly because they didn't release the tools for it. But I think I think the kids are ready for fourth edition now. They should do a rework of it. I, they should hire me over there, and then I will get immediately fired for making it a good game. Um, that's what I think. That's Even Baldur's go. Gate, dude. BG three made that game made a five E that was more like fourth edition than than uh, than five E and uh, was super popular. I, I know it's a video yeah. game, but I'm still like, I'm like well, the those kids, they, those kids who are those kids who are playing Baldur's Gates is gonna be like, oh, let's play this game in real life, and then they're gonna be like, wh- why? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> why is this so? Why is this terrible? Why why does the wizard solve every single problem we have by polymorphing? I don't understand. Why does okay. it work like I'll, that? Yeah, I would like to say that they Pathfinder solved that problem by making the fighter the best class in the game. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. As as long as he's able to touch like the the monster or whatever, it just dies, and it's like I appreciate that. You know, like it's, uh, I, I appreciate. It's, it's got you know, it's got the whole little 4E thing of like you have your martial classes to do damage, and you have your uh, spell casting classes for utility and uh, disable. It's uh, it's good. It's good. It works it's well. Good. I, 
we're big fans of Pathfinder TV around this channel. <laughs> so like, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it's, it's just nice to like uh, have have a situation arise in game, and there are rules for it, and the rules work, and and they're kind of clunky as fuck, and they slow the game down. But then you don't have to fucking argue about it for forty five minutes. You just go, it works this way, and then everyone goes, oh, it does, and you go, cool, let's move on. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, that is that is one thing that because um, I've seen you know conversations of comparisons between Pathfinder Second uh, Edition and D and D Fifth Edition, mm. um, and I don't have a lot of personal experience with Fifth Edition. Um, I only like got into a Five E campaign like very recently. I only I'm only rolling like a couple of sessions in. Hey, dude, I got a, I got a recommendation for you. Try try riding a horse in Fifth Edition. Just see how that goes for you. <laughs> just do it. Just, gi just give it a shot. Just I don't give know. it a shot. For you. <laughs> Just, just tell your GM you want to ride a horse, and then ride that horse into combat. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty common fantasy, right? That should be easy to adjudicate, right? <laughs> Tom, Tom, you gotta stop, man. That's like the that's like the bane of every tabletop existence. It's like, how do I write mount rules that doesn't my, immediately explode the system? Like my classic, <laughs> my classic example of this was like was like I played in the fifth edition game, and my character was a paladin riding her fucking summoned horse mount. And um, I had a big, long, like, 20-minute argument with my GM about how this would work. Meanwhile, 30 feet away, our rogue was going 90 feet a second <laughs> with a fly spell <laughs> on and haste on them. Because the rules for magic are extremely clear and well-delineated, while the rules for riding a fucking horse are extremely unclear. And don't work at all. Uh, uh, a spell that I used to summon a mount just didn't do anything because the rules suck uh, anyway <laughs> i was gonna say we share the same sentiment about 5e <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like... <laughs> yeah it's just like i don't know man just it, it's like it's like you you uh i was uh, I, like make make things more rules light or like make the rules good it's really simple <laughs> which way western man come on pick it <laughs> Yeah, Let's there go. you go. There you go, folks. Super, super secret second tip of the week. Just make make the rules either light or good. One or the other. Yeah, yeah. It's really simple. There's two kinds of rules: light or good, N or, or non-existent or good. That's it. There's, there isn't there isn't a middle ground. I'm looking at you, Daggerheart. <laughs> Stop. You're like tearing that thing apart. <laughs> I saw the the tweet about the milk box and how you're just basically invincible. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I like. I actually like a lot of things about that game. I don't want to be harsh on it. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really vibing with it. But I'm also like, fuck, dude. You guys are gonna be in such hell if you don't balance this properly and actually like realize you're trying to make a miniatures game, um, yeah, which they are. True. But they try to pretend they're not, which is funny. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think they at least have the, the benefit of a very large player base to do some playtesting with. Yeah, so. you're going to have me on another 45 minutes if you want me to talk about that <laughs> shit. Uh, I was going to say, we we got to wrap this up because, uh, you know, <laughs> I think, uh, I think that, we've, we're, we're, we're here and uh, poor Calvin has to edit this this uh, thing in the future. So That's right. That is true. Yeah. Um, there's probably a bunch of other stuff we can go on about for another whole hour. But... Well, you gotta have me back on at some point. There you go. Exactly. Okay, well, is there anything either of you want to say before we roll into the uh, outro of this episode? Uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, Tom Bloom, you can follow me on socials. Orbital Dropkick is my Twitter handle. I'm also the same on Blue Sky, which is uh, public access, so you can just go in there without having to, like, sign up for the hell site that is uh, Elon Musk's xzone.com, whatever the fuck it's called nowadays. Um, you can also find me at my uh, my comic at kill6billiondemons.com. It's a free webcomic. There's like 900 pages up there. If you like Lancer, you will love my comic. Um, we have a co-print coming with uh, Dark Horse Comics for Lancer, so, uh, uh, including a cool alternate cover you can only uh, get through our website, which will be available in probably, I think, in June at this point. Uh, so in June you should be able to order it, and you can already pre-order it, pre it from your local bookstore. Uh, so go to your local comic shop or game shop and ask them to pre-order the Lancer hard copy for you. You can get it. For, uh, it's from Penguin, Penguin Random House is a, is a distributor. Or you can wait till June and order a sick ultimate cover version directly from us, which gives us more money. Uh, yeah, that's it. Nice. And we'll have all the uh, we'll have all the social stuff and we'll have the website linked below on the YouTube description, um, as well as on all the other platforms, um, assuming links work there. Oh yeah, it's at LancerRPG.com, I should say. That's our site. All right. Uh, well, Tom, thanks for coming by, hanging out. I know we have 
like as, as always, whenever we have someone on, uh, we always get into certain tangents and everything. Oh, I'm then... I'm, I'm infamous for this, man. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I hope it was vaguely on topic the whole time. Let's find out. Yeah, well, uh, we'll we'll fix it in post. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it was good to have you on. Um, really exciting just to talk about Lancer and your ideas and just working on different projects and things. And I do want to get some more of your opinions on certain topics, but I feel like we'll have to save that for another episode. No problem. Um, all right. Uh, so again, as I said, uh, there's going to be a bunch of links below that you can go ahead and check out. And while you're looking at those links down there, there's also links to all the other, uh, Lancer writers and creators we've talked to, links to their itch.io pages and wherever else they have their work posted. So if you're interested in spicing up your Lancer games, go ahead and check those out. Um, additionally, I also wanted to mention the Untold Stories project, a Twitch channel where I'm at uh, sometimes a couple of times a week. They have the uh, their Freedom League Dark uh, Mutants and Mastermind series is returning. So I'll be there every Wednesday having a whole lot of fun with that crew, um, which is again, also linked below. Uh, additionally, if you are listening to us on YouTube, uh, we have live gaming streams every week, every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. So uh, go ahead and check those out. Um, Alan Wake 2 will be starting very soon within the next few weeks, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, also, uh, this is a very new thing. This is uh, breaking news, basically. We are on Spotify and other podcast platforms. By the time you're listening to this, we should be basically everywhere uh with an rss feed available because i know people have been asking for that for a while and that's finally been set up so we'll have you know other relevant links to that as people need them but that's about all i have to say um any last comment between the two of you before we end the episode uh tom it was great it was it was great yeah thanks thanks thanks, thanks for having me yeah 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 (laughs) we had the same thought yeah (laughs) perfect All right, well, for all of our GMs and players and tabletop RPG enjoyers out there, just remember to keep on winning with dice, and we'll see you next time. Bye, guys. See ya.